Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. From the St. Louis Public Radio Newsroom, this is The Gateway. It's Friday, October 16th. I'm Sarah Fenton in for Wayne Pratt. Ahead, farmers are trying to figure out what they can expect from the next president, whether it's Joe Biden or four more years of Donald Trump. The president's been very clear. He sees the, the approach he's taking, this hardline approach, is one that in his mind works. St. Louis Public Radio's Jonathan All reports on the differences in agriculture policy between the main two candidates and if they'll have any impact on the outcome of the election. That's coming up, but first, these headlines. Thursday, Missouri rolled out plans for distributing the coronavirus vaccine when it becomes available. The vaccine will be given in phases. It likely won't be widely available until next spring. But nursing home residents, long-term care facility staff, and other health care workers will have access to it first. State Public Health Director Randall Williams says there will be a, quote, finite amount of vaccines to start. Our North Star is always individual patients. Our second North Star is always preventing spread in the community. So we have prioritized it to do just that. According to the document, as vaccine availability increases, every Missourian is expected to receive one at no cost. Law enforcement officials are crediting a late summer surge of federal agents with a big drop in violent crime in St. Louis. In August, U.S. Attorney General William Barr announced agents would be in the city as part of Operation Legend. In an appearance in St. Louis yesterday, Barr said data showed there were 39 fewer homicides in the eight weeks after the agents arrived compared with the eight weeks before, and 144 fewer aggravated assaults. But University of Missouri-Kansas City criminology professor Kenneth Novak says it's too soon to make any big claims. It's unclear whether a surge in law enforcement actually caused any change or whether the natural ebb and flow of crime rates was going to go down anyway. The city is still on pace for a record number of homicides, with 212 people killed as of yesterday. Barr did not take any questions during the event. Researchers at Washington University are testing a possible treatment for COVID-19 known as monoclonal antibodies. St. Louis Public Radio's Shayla Farzan explains. The human immune system is constantly producing proteins called antibodies that fight pathogens and viruses. Scientists have made a synthetic version for decades called monoclonal antibodies used to treat a range of ailments from cancer to arthritis. WashU researchers are now part of a national team testing several monoclonal antibodies as possible COVID-19 treatments. The question is whether these antibodies help keep newly infected people from getting sicker, says WashU infectious disease specialist Dr. Rachel Presti. What we're looking for is mainly can we keep people out of the hospital. The team is also testing whether antibodies can help seriously ill patients recover faster. I'm Shayla Farzan, St. Louis Public Radio. In other coronavirus news, the number of people hospitalized for the virus in Missouri has reached another record, and the seven-day average positivity rate was more than triple the benchmark suggested by the World Health Organization. 1,443 people were hospitalized in Missouri on Wednesday, setting a new record for the third straight day. The state health department's COVID-19 dashboards showed on Thursday there were 1,875 new confirmed cases and 22 deaths. The state's seven-day positivity rate was 17.9 percent. That national seven-day positivity rate was at 5.1 percent, according to Johns Hopkins University data. The World Health Organization has set 5 percent as the benchmark. Agriculture policy is not getting much attention in the run-up to the presidential election. But farmers are looking closely at what they might be able to expect from four more years of Donald Trump versus a Joe Biden administration. St. Louis Public Radio's Jonathan All reports there aren't a lot of solid answers, and any difference may not matter anyway. Jim Mulhern says he's often asked what the next four years will be like depending on who wins the presidential election. The president of the National Milk Producers Federation says that really depends on how the candidates will treat trade. Mulhern says President Trump has created a mixed bag for farmers through a series of tariffs that have led to retaliation and a trade war with China and other countries. Uh, Look, the president's been very clear. 
he sees the, the approach he's taking, uh, this hardline approach, um, as, as one that, that uh, um, in his mind works and I think is likely to probably continue. We have no reason to expect anything different. Mulhern says those trade policies have hurt many farmers, but they tend to support the overall goal of holding other countries accountable and looking for better deals. In terms of Joe Biden, Mulhern says it's less clear. None of us um, can give an, a, a real strong view of, of what a trade policy would look like um, in a Biden administration other than likely to be attempts to do um, trade agreements like has been done in the past. Specifically during the Obama administration, when Biden was vice president and Tom Vilsack was the secretary of agriculture. Biden has presented his plan for rural America, which includes general language about trade policies that work for farmers and promoting biofuels. That's exactly what Pam Johnson wants to hear. She and her family grow corn and soybeans on a thousand acres in northern Iowa. She says she can't make it without a U.S. commitment to ethanol and other biofuels. My farm's um, success and ability to survive depends on support of that market, that domestic market. Johnson says tariffs that end up reducing her access to foreign markets also hurt. President Trump has been hard on ethanol until September when he announced a policy approving use of existing filling station pumps to distribute higher ethanol gasoline. Johnson says it's too little too late, and she's voting for Biden. But Scott Long says even though President Trump doesn't know a lot about agriculture, he has surrounded himself with people who do. Long, who raises cattle on 1,000 acres in southern Missouri and owns a 10-employee meat processing operation, says he likes Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue's commitment to reducing regulation. As long as people have the right to farm and the right to run cattle or hogs, sheep, whatever they want to do, we need people in there that are going to respect that. And I think, I think Sonny Perdue has that type of attitude toward it. Long says Trump's hard line on trade will be worth it in the long run to all Americans, including farmers, and he supports the administration's policies. But the farm vote may not mean much this election. David Kimball is a political science professor at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. He says rural voters overwhelmingly supported Donald Trump in 2016 and will again, regardless of how they feel about his agriculture policy. A lot of rural voters are not farmers necessarily either. So the people working in the ag industry is a fairly small portion of the American electorate, which is, I think, another reason why you know agriculture policy may not be top of mind for many voters. Kimball says the only way ag might be the difference is if the election comes down to one or two swing states with large rural areas. But with issues like coronavirus, the economy, and Supreme Court nominations looming large, agriculture issues won't get much attention between now and November 3rd. In Rala, I'm Jonathan All, St. Louis Public Radio. That piece is part of the station's partnership with Harvest Public Media, a collaboration that reports on food and agriculture in the Midwest, based in Kansas City. That piece was edited by Harvest Public Media's Maria Carter. The executive editor of St. Louis Public Radio is Shula Newman. Our music is by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Sarah Fentum, and from the St. Louis Public Radio newsroom, this has been The Gateway. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com.